to bring about innovative solutions. The ILO has been working with its constituents, cooperative and social solidarity and economy, social and solidarity economy movement for its cooperative units since 1920. So it means one year, 100 years ago. On the occasion of this centenary, a series of activities have been scheduled, including a series of webinars, photo exhibits, special virtual issue of journals, other publication, and an international symposium that will take place in November. And I want to congratulate my colleague Simel, who is uh, the head of the cooperative unit for this initiative. Today, this webinar on advancing gender equality in and through cooperative is the second webinar of the series uh, organized in the context of the celebration of the centenary. Equality and non-discrimination, as you know, is at the heart of the ILO and we are working intensively across the organization to move toward more equality of opportunity and treatment among workers, among workers without discrimination based on gender, but also other factors such as nationality, health, or contractual status. So my name, maybe I should have begin with that. I am Philip Markena, I'm the Chief of the Inclusive Labor Market, Labor Relations and Working Condition Branch in the ILO. I work with Cooperative and Mutual Association before coming to the ILO, when I joined the ILO, and my work now includes a lot of work. I am in charge of leading the activity on the informal economy in the organization. We are pleased to have four great speakers in a webinar today, coming from four different countries and continents, to share their different perspectives with us today. The speaker will speak 12 to 15 minutes each, and then we will have a question and answer session. Because before beginning the presentation, some practical issues to facilitate a fruitful webinar. So please note the following. For the stability of the connection, please keep your microphone mute and your webcam turn off through the webinar. If micro webcam of some of you are on, we will take the liberty of turning them off. We will have Q&A question after the presentation from the fourth speaker. You can write and send your question in the chat tab anytime during the webinar. Please clarify whether your question is in general or addressed to specific speaker. Use the everyone can see mode when doing that. We will record this webinar and make it available on the ILO website in two days. We start from the local and national perspective and move toward more regional and global ones. Our first speaker is Mirai Chatterjee, who is the chairperson of the Self-Employed Women Association Cooperative Federation in India. And you know, most of you, I suppose, if not everybody, SEWA. The membership of 106 cooperatives that have over 300,000 women members from six different sectors. I had the pleasure to work with Mirai in the past, and I'm very pleased to be with her today again. Mira is also a board member of WIPO Women in Informal Employment Globalizing Organizing Network. So Mira will speak about the Sewa Cooperative Federation role in COVID-19 response and beyond. She will be followed by Sifa Shiyogi, who is the director of the International Cooperative Alliance for the African region based in Nairobi, Kenya. She is a cooperative trainer, educator, and practitioner, and she will share the experience of women participation in cooperative from the African continent. Our first speaker is Stefania Marcone. Stefania is the Chief International Relations and European Policy Legacop Italy. She is also the Vice President of the Cooperative Europe Board. She is also a member of the Gender Equality Committee of the International Cooperative Alliance. She will share her experience and observation regarding the COVID-19 crisis 
and will you co give a broader panorama on the integration of gender equality in the cooperative movement at the regional and international level. Our final speaker is Nadia Weber, who is a Canadian researcher working as an independent consultant on cooperative issues. She worked with the International Cooperative Alliance and the Committee for the Promotion and Advancement of Cooperative, doing a literature review on gender equality issues in cooperative. This research was preceded by a global survey on the topic. She will share, share some results from her research with us now. Mirai, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Philippe. And I'm also delighted to reconnect with you, albeit virtually. I would also like to greet all sisters and brothers who are with us today on this webinar in the circle of solidarity. In these challenging times, it's good to be together and to share ideas and experiences. Um, I'll be speaking today about Seva's experience with cooperation and then also we'll speak to the current crisis and how we are trying to face it. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we can go straight to the next slide, please. The next slide. Is it possible? Ah, thank you very much. So as many of you probably know already that um, we, we need to go back one. Thank you. Um, mean it. Um, as many of you would know, 93% of the Indian workforce or about 500 million workers, women and men are in the informal economy in India. And I think we're going a little too fast. Could we go back two slides, please? Thank you. Um, we've gone ahead of ourselves. Yeah, we have to go back, I'm afraid. Now we have to go back, we're going forward. Sorry about this, folks. Yeah, one more, please, back. Thank you so much. All right, never mind. Um, as I said, the vast majority of the Indian workforce is in the informal economy, upward of 500 million workers, it is estimated. Thank you for that. And our con contribution to India's GDP and growth story is large. And uh, as you all know, uh, and many of you are from countries with large informal economies, there's little or no work and income security or social protection. And of course, there's the overlap between informality, poverty, and gender with women in India and probably in most countries being among the poorest, most vulnerable and discriminated against because of patriarchy. Next, please. Um, while we're waiting for the slide, yeah. So as was mentioned, we are a national trade union of 1.7 million workers across 18 states of the country founded by Ila Ben Bhatt, a labor organizer and lawyer, almost 50 years ago now, and inspired by the values of You have a problem of connection, Mirai? Um, way back in the year 1917, and from uh, the, I think my, I'm going to have to put this off. Yeah. yeah. So um, from the tradition of labor organizing, um, Seva was born. And I mentioned this particularly because I think perhaps this is something that's different about Seva. Our whole journey with cooperatives and cooperation actually came out of the labor movement, out of union organizing. And it happened this way, that when we were organizing informal workers in the city of Ahmedabad, 
one of the first things that came up was the need for financial services, access to financial services. And we went to the mainstream banks and they frankly slammed the doors shut in our face. Um, and by the way, this has been a recurring uh, theme that whenever we approach the mainstream institutions on behalf of informal women workers, uh, we are told this is not possible and that is not possible. And so it was the women who said, if no one will have us, why don't we form our own bank? And we chose the cooperative form uh, because we ourselves were a labor union. We believed in workers' organizations and democratic functioning. And you know, cooperation and cooperative seemed the logical and most effective uh, route to go. The first cooperative we set up way back in 1974 was Seva Bank, which started with 40,000 women, informal workers, who pooled their daily wage at the time of 10 rupees. And today we have more than 600,000 depositors and um, 400 crores. How much is that? Uh, I, you know, well, it's a lot. It's about 25 or 30 million US dollars. Um, of, of savings and deposits of informal workers. And then there was really no looking back. Um, and I must say here, our founder, Ila Ben, um, was also influenced by labor movement and cooperative movements in different parts of the world. She took training at the Histridut Institute in Israel and came back quite fired up because she saw that the entire Israeli economy at the time, in the 60s this was, was very much based on cooperation and cooperatives. The next sort of uh, milestone was when we were organizing garment workers. And there we found that um, our typical union struggle for minimum wage, although valid and very much needed, wasn't making headway. And it was then that some of the women said, we are poor, but we know how to sew. And if you help us with access to raw material and working capital and marketing, we can form our own unit. Why should we work for these exploitative contractors and middlemen? And that's really how our first artisan cooperative, Sabina, was born uh, uh, way back in 1977. And then we began to organize people in rural areas, farmers, uh, again for minimum wage because there, there were big landlords there. Although I must say, as an aside, that most of our members are self-employed. So there's no question of an employer, obviously. They hardly have an employer or a shifting employer. But when we organized farm workers and demanded minimum wages from the landlords, um, there was violence. Um, there was, our colleagues were beaten up. And we realized that in a labor surplus economy like India, um, if you don't have alternative livelihood, that does not build your bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis how from one thing uh, and one struggle to another, we understood the importance of cooperatives. And importantly, cooperatives, what we call the joint strategy of union and cooperative struggle and development. And today, as you can see, we have 120 women cooperatives across India. A hundred of those are in our home state of Gujarat, which where the Seva movement began. Very quickly, the six different types of cooperatives you can see up there. I've given you names of two of the cooperatives. Megha is an indigenous women farmers cooperative. And my sister there standing with a satin sugar cane with her head covered. She is from Megha Cooperative. Ekta is an organic women farmers cooperative, organic farming of spices from the Himalaya. Financial services, I've already spoken about Seva Bank. Vimo Seva or Seva Insurance is Seva's only national cooperative registered under the Multi-State Cooperative Act and with shareholders in five Indian states. And we have more than a dozen savings and credit cooperatives across India. The largest number of cooperatives we have are women dairy cooperatives, as you can see. And this is an interesting story because in our home state of Ahmedabad, there is a very robust, even today, uh, dairy cooperative movement. 
But we found that those who do all the work around dairy, namely women, were nowhere in the picture. Neither were they shareholders, nor did they have any voice in the cooperative or any of the district level federations. And so that's where we came in. I've already spoken about Sabina, one of our artisan cooperatives, and Abudana, and you can see the woman there doing applique work in the photograph. Um, services, except for Seva Bank, came later in our history, more in the 80s and then 90s, when we began to develop cooperatives for childcare, domestic workers, and healthcare. And I should also say that our health cooperative, which I'm involved with, is running a chain of pharmacies and producing low-cost sanitizers, which has come in very handy during the COVID crisis. And finally, construction workers, cleaning. You can see the woman there cleaning um, and so on. So this is just to give you a quick peek of the cooperatives. Next, please. All these cooperatives then were joined in a federation in 1992, because by 1992, we had about 33 women cooperatives. So they needed various support services, which are listed in the slide, including business development, capacity building, marketing, of course, that's one of the most, uh, the ones that's in very high demand always, financial services, digital inclusion, and others. Next, please. Yeah, I think now we, this is what is uppermost in all of our minds. All of us, I'm, I'm sure, in the cooperative movement across the globe are living, breathing, sleeping the issues, worrying about our shareholders, worrying about our members, and so also at SEBA. So um, from the early days of March, we began distributing food uh, kits, food meaning wheat and rice and other essential items and health kits, which consisted of the sanitizers, which I've already mentioned. And in the photograph, you see one of my sisters who's wearing a mask and packing sanitizers. We were able to quickly produce sanitizers, thanks to also good cooperation from our government, because I must tell you that in the early days of our lockdown and crisis, neither masks nor sanitizers were available. And wherever they were, they were totally unaffordable for poor informal workers. So that's a service that we were able to do. Our biggest uh, response at the moment is an emergency health response. Fortunately, we had a health cooperative with feet on the ground and also health teams in 10 other states where SEVA is organizing workers. So with the support of the World Health Organization and the Government of India's training module, we have now trained more than 500 grassroots women leaders to spread the messages about COVID digitally on WhatsApp, telephones, and where possible in rural areas, also door to door. Um, livelihoods, as with every country in the world, has taken the, the most severe hit. But fortunately, our home-based worker sisters have been making masks and uh, that has at least given them some income and providing a useful service. Um, it has been very hard for farmers supplying, negotiating with the government to restore the supply chain. Another aspect is that in our domestic workers cooperative, we negotiated with employers uh, because obviously they can't go out to work uh, that they do not cut their salary and their wages. One of the things we feel quite uh, pleased about is that we were able to link with large insurance companies and get them to develop a low cost product, just 150 rupees, which is I think two US dollars, which will cover people up to 25,000 rupees uh, for COVID-19 disease. So that now is being rolled out. Our government, after the initial lockdown, announced a package of $23 billion um, and various uh, uh, sort of benefits. But always in our country, there's been a problem of actually getting the benefits to the workers, to where they're supposed to, the last mile delivery problem. So we are actively working with local government to ensure these benefits reach. And finally, and importantly, 
we have been, based on our experiences from the ground, appealing to the government to provide food, free food. India has excess stocks. We have 77 million metric tons of food stocks. So we've been saying, give them free now to all workers, all people who want them, cash transfers, and particularly to migrants. So these are some of the things that we've been. And I end my presentation with some of the recommendations very quickly. Next, please. Yeah. So the immediate is, of course, that without community involvement, particularly of women workers, informal workers who have feet on the ground, who have credibility, who are trusted, it will be very difficult to do contact tracing because I don't know about in your countries, but there's serious fear and stigma issues now in our country. So contact tra tracing, testing, all of this is very important. And of course, distribution immediately of emergency food kits. The government has stepped in a little bit more with food. It's going better, but there's still a gap and we are trying to bridge that gap. The long-term one, which has been, of course, a long-term campaign of SEVA and many others, is that we now cannot wait. We have to invest in public health. We may squeeze through the net this time, but there won't be a next time if we don't take action and invest at least 2.5% of GDP in India on primary health care and so on. Livelihood restoration, ILO estimates, as you can see in the slide, that 400 million informal workers in India will fall into poverty. May fall is, I mean, they will fall. Um, they're already falling into poverty, unfortunately. So we are in discussion with our government for payroll compensation. Uh, like many of your countries, working capital, including loans, and preferably buying products of cooperatives, particularly women's cooperatives, and taking their services to re restore livelihoods and the supply chains. And of course, in the long term, we need a livelihood restoration fund with social protection. There's no shortcut to this and universal for all workers. And finally, policies for restoring and building up livelihoods locally in a huge country like ours, which is so diverse, it has to be a decentralized local effort, bit by bit, rebuilding, building up. And the first step would be identity cards for all informal workers. We've had a huge issue, as you've all probably seen on the news, of 40, more than 40 million migrant workers, internal migrants. And it's been very difficult to support them because there's no tracking system, no identity cards. All our schemes are not yet portable. That means they, from one to the next, you, cannot, uh, you may not get the benefit, and so on and so forth. And of course, as I've been saying, universal social protection, universal health care and child care. And finally, and most importantly as well, digital inclusion. Uh, it has been hard for many of our Seva sisters because they don't all have smartphones. They don't have access to mobile, mobile technologies. Um, and they don't know how to use them, even if there is a smartphone in the home. Of course, the situation is changing. People have more smartphones than before but still we have a way to go. So this is a very quick snapshot and I'm very happy to take questions and happy to be here. Thank you, Mirai. Uh, so what we will do, we will take the question, but we will put the question at the end of the presentation to this is more easy for managing time. So now I give the floor to Sifa. Sifa, it's up to you, 15 minutes max. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for Ella for this opportunity to share some thoughts on um, the issue of um, gender and the uh, cooperative in Africa. But before I start that, can we have the presentation, please? Um, if the presentation is not up, I can as well um, talk without the presentation. Um, I, I will first take you through the introduction, then I'll speak a bit on uh, Africa and um, go, uh, the issue, maybe some few talks on uh, Africa, then uh, cooperative in Africa, and finally challenges and the way forward. So I would like to say first and foremost that we have got um, a one point, about 1.3 billion um, uh, people in Africa. 
and our median age is uh, 19.4. So we are the youngest uh, cooperative, uh, the youngest uh, continent on, on the earth. And that has uh, given us an advantage vis-a-vis -vis this uh, crisis of um, COVID-19, but as well, it's also a challenge because most of our youth are unemployed. So today I'll also uh, talk about um, mostly focusing on the gender inequality. And I'd like to say that uh, gender inequality is a topic which has been uh, 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 receiving some um, high interest even at the highest level, that is the African Union. And uh, by the way, uh, this year will mark the end of our women's, African women's decade. So our leaders did uh, declare 2012 women's, uh, the African women decade to try and fast track the women empowerment on the continents. But as you'll see uh, throughout the, the, the presentation, the situation has not changed that much. Uh, next, please. I can see the presentation is up now. Um, I'd like to say that, um, uh, please pass again. We had already, I think, passed that one. Thank you. Uh, I'd like also to say that um, the, the, in terms of um, gender inequality, uh, I'd like to make some few uh, statements is that um, women um, are less uh, in a, a global uh, labor force compared to their counterparts men, but also we do lead in the unpaid labor. So that is a dichotomy and a irony in terms of uh, how women, when it comes to money, we are lagging behind, but when it comes to unpaid labor, then we are leading. I'd like also to make a statement saying that uh, one of the causes which is uh, making us not doing very well could be um, shown through uh, the Human Development Index. Again, when you look at that, uh, women are, uh, are lagging behind by 6%. Uh, percent compared to their counterparts, the men. Uh, pass. Pass. Uh, uh, this graph shows the different uh, stages and uh, the, 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 the trend of um, different uh, continents uh, compared to, uh, <coughs> to the, how they are faring in terms of uh, human development index. And this is very capital as we shall uh, move along the the, 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 the presentation, you'll come to understand that some of the issues that the African woman uh, is, suff is uh, suffering from are inherited from the, the, the environment. Like you can see the Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, again uh, trailing in terms of uh, human development index, which then translates into the, um, um, uh, the, the, the low participation, participation of, uh, in women in terms of uh, uh, formal education paths. Uh, this again is just uh, a graph which is uh, again showing the um, how Africa again is faring compared to the other continents. And this one is uh, trending the, over the years how um, the, the, we have uh, the, the, the African, some of these African countries are faring. But what is more important here is to show that from 20, uh, 2000 to 2015, those are 15 years, you can see that there is uh, um, somehow the trend is the same. We have not made, uh, made much gain in terms of, uh, of, of uh, uh, women empowerment. And um, please pass. I would like also to say that uh, when you look at um, the women participation, especially now zeroing into private sector, and especially the SMEs, where some of the cooperatives are uh, mostly found, you could see that uh, again, uh, in terms of women uh, leadership or, or, or ownership rather, uh, we only have one third of, uh, of one third um, Women, women are uh, owners of, uh, only one third of women are owners of uh, SMEs in Africa. Whereas um, we are majority in the informal e economy. Um, uh, I was very happy to listen to my sister Mirai and how they have uh, indeed used uh, the vehicle to empower the, the, the women in the informal economy. 
And uh, maybe that is where we are looking for so that we can be able to now translate the majority of uh, African women who are in the formal of, uh, economy, how then they can graduate into formal economy and change this one, one third. Uh, and again, what I'd like to point out here at this particular agenda is that um, most of our women entrepreneurs in Africa, they go there through necessity, not opportunity. And that has got in itself some uh, limitations in terms of how um, one can expand and scale up the business. Please pass. Again, here we are looking at, uh, um, this is still in the introduction, looking at uh, how the, the, the women are faring in terms of uh, leadership. I was very uh, astonished to see that uh, African women and the generally women in, uh, across the globe, they are faring well in, in, uh, in politics or uh, political jobs than the private sector, like illustrated here. Only 5% of uh, CEOs are women, and yet 20% uh, members of cabinet are women, and again 25% a percent are, uh, are um, member of parliament. This is quite, a, quite an eye opening because we are quite, most of the time we are more harsh on the politicians and yet politics is more accommodating to women than the private sector. Please pass. Uh, looking keenly on Africa now and uh, how, um, how many women um, we have in the boards of uh, some organization in Africa again, there is the difference uh, when it comes to other sub-regions. Again, you can see that in Southern African, women are more uh, occupying the leadership position in terms of board participation compared to their part, uh, counterpart in, uh, in, in, in North Africa. And this could be explained by so many things among them, the, uh, the, 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 the culture, religion, and so many other things. But uh, this, we, we shall look at them, them maybe in the future, but for now, it's just to, to try and uh, illustrate that Africa is not the same. We have got uh, um, uh, we have got some variation when it comes to some regions and uh, some countries, depending on uh, uh, so many factors uh, among them: culture, religion, and the, and the, and, the, and the like. Plus, um, again, this uh, graph is showing us again the the the, the, the position of uh, women. Um, in leadership position and uh, compared to businesses. Again, we can see that uh, we are almost, uh, Africa is not very far. This is a general situation and I, I, I know that um, Stefan and uh, Nadia will come after me will be talking about the global scene. Um, they, they will show that the situation of women in Africa and uh, across the globe is quite similar, uh, if not the same, especially in terms of um, less um, position for women in leadership among the others. Please pass. Um, it's quite interesting to look at this particular graph and see which sector the women are more represented than the others. And then we have come to realize that like a few ones, like manufacturing where we thought quite uh, less will be, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, women are faring quite well uh, compared to the other sectors followed by uh, retail trade hotels. Those are service one. I think that was a um, usual, usual suspect. Uh, finance, again, is also a usual suspect. And the government, like I've said, is very um, um, awkward to see that women are faring quite well in public sector compared to the private sector. And uh, that is not um, what we tend to think as we think that um, uh, the private sector was supposed to, to be more empowering compared to the public sector. Please pass. Uh, in terms of uh, ownership, um, again, this is just showing the subsectors in, uh, in Africa. And I've already alluded to the fact that um, 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 uh, Southern Africa, West Africa faring quite well, uh, even Central Africa compared to the North Africa. So ownership and the managerial position and leadership positions, women are, uh, are not faring quite very well in, Af in North Africa compared to the other sub-regions of uh, Africa. Please pass. Uh, sectorial uh, distribution, again, here we have looked at uh, specific countries, and this just, we are firm to have said that we are faring quite 
uh, not too bad the manufacturing uh, retail industry among others pass yeah women in cooperative this is the the gist of the presentation because i was called to talk about women in cooperative but i wanted first to to set the stage and talk about the the, the position of women in uh, public affairs generally speaking that is from the global scene up to the african region now as we have seen women are not uh, faring very well across um, the continent and also in africa in terms of uh, leadership position uh, and also uh, ownership position. And uh, how can we address the issue? So here we are putting uh, forward um, the solution. We are, we, are, we are saying that cooperatives are a good avenue for women participation in leadership, but also in ownership. And uh, why? It's because of um, the issue of uh, gender equity, which is well addressed in cooperative because of the principles and values uh, cooperative being um, um, uh, um, being a member owned and member controlled uh, uh, entities. We like also to say that through the cooperatives, the women could be able to access uh, resources and markets. I did not want to go too much into the details in some of the the the, 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 the slides, but definitely why women are not uh, in. Um, like in the ownership where we are talking about the SMEs, one third only are uh, uh, owners of SMEs. It's because of limited access to resources. They cannot have finances to be able to, uh, uh, to start their own businesses. That is the formal one, and that is why they're still in the informality, most of them. And the access to market as well also has been a challenge. And uh, why? Because of so many other things, but am among them, uh, the level of education also is hampering, especially those ones who are in fo informal economy, to, to get into the formal economies. We like also to say that um, cooperative could be uh, the best avenue for mainstreaming gender uh, into uh, global affairs, that is the labor market, uh, um, private sector uh, businesses, but also um, uh, public life. And also more, more, more so also because cooperatives are uh, good at um, alleviating uh, 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 poverty. Remember that these are community-based organizations, and more so in this time of um, of uh, the COVID-19, we have seen how um, again we, we had to rethink, and we are in the process of rethinking our position vis-a-vis -vis the world affairs because it has, we have come to the realization that the status quo is not uh, working and we need other, uh, that is the, the other, uh, other form of economies which are more inclusive and again, uh, the cooperative like well demonstrated by Mirai becomes uh, uh, the best enterprise to address the issue first. First, these are some of, sorry, these are some of the case studies uh, we have, they are also on our websites on women cooperatives. The one which, which just passed, this, the first last, which uh, uh, passed was about the cooperative in Ethiopia. Uh, they were mostly uh, focusing on the green cooperatives and the post harvesting, uh, addressing the issue of post uh, harvesting losses. In the far front, we have had uh, some of the cooperatives which are uh, solely by women. These are women uh, owned and run cooperative and this one from Namibia becomes the best one. What they have done actually it was to um, turn their misfortune into opportunity. In Namibia, the, the, the seed of the Amarula could only be picked by women. That is, that, that is their tra tradition. And what the, the women took that as a, what was a, a disadvantage, they turned into the business uh, opportunity. And today as we talk, uh, they have a big and a very vibrant um, Amarula Oil uh, Cooperative, and the only man around is a watchman, so the guard is the only man around. And uh, you can see how um, using their own natural, uh, I mean, uh, local resources, they have been able to address some of their issues pass. Uh, this is, I think this is the Ethiopia one, which I've already alluded to, pass again. Uh, this is now the one of, uh, I think this would be the Southern, uh, uh, Southern um, African. We have had the uh, women in uh, different sectors of, uh, especially the agricultural cooperatives. Remember that they are, they are the majority workers in uh, agricultural cooperatives, though 
rarely the owners of the, those cooperatives. And uh, here we have got uh, the, the fruits and vegetable cooperatives. Please pass, owned by the women again. This YouTube at your own time, you can be able to run it because time is not on our side. It's again from Morocco. It's again uh, women cooperatives. Uh, they are um, involved in, um, in the different um, um, activities, but more so the essential oil and uh, uh, as much as uh, and others. So across Africa, you can see from south to south, uh, to, from south to, to central, no, east, south, east and north, we have had um, examples of case studies of uh, women cooperatives and uh, these are very, um, these are uh, very strong women cooperative which has been able and uh, which we could use to replicate in other settings, countries or within the same uh, uh, country. Please pass. So, so, in a nutshell, what could be uh, the challenges uh, that uh, women are experiencing? That is uh, generally speaking, but also women in co uh, cooperative. Uh, as much as uh, we have said that cooperatives are good avenues for mainstreaming gender um, and uh, for women empowerment, and they have also shown uh, some examples of women in cooperatives spanning from South up to North Africa. But unfortunately, even in, Af in, a, in, a, in a cooperative movement, we still have less women in leadership position and also less women in managerial position. For example, it's only uh, in recent years that we have had uh, women president of the ICA Global and also two uh, regional uh, um, uh, directors who were women. I was the very first regional director in ICA to be uh, as a woman. So, and, and this is not, uh, it's less than 10 years. Ago. The same applies for the uh, highest leadership, that is uh, president, uh, uh, two president, uh, women uh, president in ICA. And uh, again, when it, it comes to what we have noticed, the challenges is that in the cooperative movement, women are members, and they, in fact, they even they make a, a junk of their clientele. But when it comes to uh, leadership position, again, um, that is where the issue comes. And this could be explained by so many other things among them uh, uh, because they don't own resources. Like I said, in agricultural cooperative, because of uh, the cultures and the religion and other things, women don't own land in some of the, uh, the, the, the places. And um, again, uh, the cooperative is more of the household, the household. And they, 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 they automatically the head of the household, who is the, the, the man, becomes the member of the cooperative when it comes to to receiving the goodies uh, or accessing the, the goodies. When it, it comes to um, some of the, the, the bylaws uh, of, of uh, cooperative, especially like cultural again, are very limited, very limiting in terms of uh, leadership position. Sometimes they come up with those uh, bylaws saying that uh, unless you, you, you are able to produce this amount of uh, kgs of coffee, you cannot uh, vie for the position. And definitely because the coffee uh, belongs to the man, the woman, the woman only works in the farm, then definitely that becomes uh, a hindrance. Um, we have also um, had in some instances the issue of violence. Definitely uh, Africa is uh, leading in terms of civil unrest and, and, and the like. And this is also somehow mirrored in the cooperative movements for, um, for some areas where um, some members will create some violence so that they can intimidate the women to come and, and vote or vie for the position. So those are some of uh, the, uh, the, the hindrances, which again, looking at what uh, Mirai said uh, in terms of uh, recommendation, not they can go beyond the, the, the situation of COVID-19 and, uh, and, and uh, which can they again address, uh, address some of these issues elaborated here past. Uh, the way forward is to stop first the civil uh, unrest. No peace, no development, be it in the cooperative movement or otherwise. So one thing that we have to work on and we are happy to see it happening is the unity of Africans. Uh, through the, African, uh, the Agenda 2063, we are seeing some bold move 
toward the right direction where we are unifying Africa and making sure that we silence the gun for people to be able to, uh, to work. And when, women, uh, when people can work, then the women also can work. There is also the issue of uh, access to finance. Most of the women, um, especially those in the informal uh, economy, and even those ones we have talked about are third uh, owners of the SMEs in Africa or in the world. Again, we can talk about uh, they are lacking uh, enough capital to uh, expand their businesses. Or, uh, and again, if, and that is why we would like to, uh, to borrow a leaf from uh, SEWA in terms of the, the bank for the informal economy. The issue on un unpaid um, labor, like the, 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 which takes much of our time in African setting, also uh, once addressed, could also be a solution. Please pass, time is not on our side. And uh, finally, I would say education, education, education is the solution. Educate the women for their rights, educate the, the women for, um, to take opportunities, not only um, opportunistic kind of businesses, to educate the private sector that indeed women can do it, uh, educate the, 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 the public sector, that is um, our, our government, that uh, indeed the, 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 the fights or uh, the struggle is not yet over. We are, uh, we are now past 25 years from the Beijing, but uh, uh, the, the, the crisis is still the same. Uh, those showing in different, um, um, taking different form, but the struggle is that the gender inequality is still here with us and we need to address it. Uh, I do not want to talk too much about the COVID-19, but as you know, we are the most vulnerable and the situation that Mirai and uh, Mirad from Asia is quite similar. For us, we are more um, uh, uh, on the receiving hand because even before the COVID-19, we were facing some uh, challenges emanating from food security because of the droughts, uh, locusts, invasion, and again, we had some floods in some other parts, and then you, you add the COVID-19. Uh, uh, but um, we are looking at it more positively that it has also given us the time to reflect and make sure that moving forward as a continent, as a movement, as women in leadership position in Africa, a cooperative movement, we should be able then to relook and, uh, and uh, address the issues at long term uh, as um, we have come to the realization that sustainability starts with us as, uh, at country level, at organization level, before it can go to global level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sifa, for this presentation <coughs> of uh, that spoke, described about the situation in the world continent, more precisely some example. Now I'm giving the floor to Stefania. Thank, thank you, Philip. I will, I will share my presentation. Uh, share, share screen. Can you see my presentation? Oh, uh, Stefania? Yes. So, uh, Susan, we will show you a presentation so you oh. can guide us. Um, okay, you, you, will, you will make for me? Yes. Uh, no, no. Uh, we will show your presentations on our screen. And okay. Tell us, okay. Go to the next slide, go to the next slide, etc. Okay, okay, yes. thank you. Okay, so, so first of all, I want to uh, thank for the kind invitation and congratulate uh, with the ILOCO branch, uh, with uh, the director Simelezim for having organized this webinar uh, in a very, very specific and very dramatic, uh, dramatic uh, um, uh, period that we are experiencing. Uh, please go, go on, Mina. Uh, I think that uh, uh, it is also an occasion for me to bring to you uh, the greetings 
of the alliance, Italian Alliance Gender Equality Commission, as well as of the European uh, Women Cooperators working under the Auspices of Cooperatives Europe and also of the ICA Jack. Uh, I think that we all to today have to pay a tribute to all the women that are on the COVID-19 front line. Um, some of them lost their life, some of them get uh, affected and uh, among them in all the countries of the world you can find a lot of cooperatives on the front line and a lot of women cooperators so i think that uh, um, um, the, the, um, the words of the general secretary of the united nations to put women and girls at the center of the efforts of the recovery uh, as well as the words by the IRO Director General that we need the human central response to the COVID-19 through global solidarity. It is something quite, quite important. And I would like also to take uh, this occasion, uh, please go on, Mina, uh, to share also uh, some information and some consideration on how we are living uh, this period uh, in, uh, in our country and uh, I will use the words of an appeal launched by the presidents of the Italian commissions on gender equality. As you will see, over 70% of the operators are involved in social and health services are women. Women and men do not stand back, but rather double the commitment and their fundamental contribution to local communities and countries. For them and also for their family, at the end of the emergency, will find themselves paying a, a salty bills. So it is necessary to find measures that leave no one behind. Women are the ones who risk paying the high social cost, blocked family employment today in my country is almost 70 percent, in educational service, school, primary production, in the cultural, tourism and leisure sectors where cooperators, women cooperators represent over 50 percent and the crisis is particularly felt. Many women work in the primary sectors with some components particularly hit like the flower cultivation, the fisheries, as well as we think about the young women cooperators working in the startup and also the new possibilities provided by the smart working that is important as good but there's also uh, some implication in order to balance the life uh, work balance uh, please go on mina uh, not to mention the, an alert, as we will see, devoted to fight against any form of violence. We consider the issue of credit to be dramatic. Uh, it was dramatic uh, well before the health emergency and now is much more crucial. And so there is a huge need of liquidity that will determine the survival of business and the save of employment. Uh, so it is necessary to evaluate the measure put in place with specific attention devoted to women business and in our cases, women cooperative business. Uh, this pandemic has forced the adoption of smart working, uh, and smart learning, but women are the ones who mainly manage work and care loads. And of course, a stronger sharing is needed. Please go on, Nina. There is a gap between families <clears throat> with resources and family in poverty, which is emerging clearly with distance learning, exacerbated educational poverty. Uh, so it is necessary to support the synergic re reaction to support families, school, uh, working with local authorities and the third sector, especially for all the activities that they carried out. Of course, we have the problem of gender violence, as, uh, as mentioned. Uh, unfortunately, we notice a worsening, uh, and it is important that the anti-violence centre uh, continue to have uh, their, uh, their, uh, their, their, their support, uh, because 
we are in a moment where really, really it is so important and so vital, uh, these activities. And I want also to share the fact that there are a lot of cooperatives uh, in my country, but I think so also in several other countries that are working on, the, on these aspects to provide support to women uh, victims of violence, uh, psychological support, to provide uh, labor, labor inclusion, to provide any kind of possible support, to give them a chance uh, to look uh, the future uh, with some more hope uh, uh, for a better, a better life uh, for her and their families. Uh, please, Mina, go on. As mentioned, uh, cooperatives are on the front line all over the world. <clears throat> I would like to share with you, beyond the example that you will see that uh, belongs uh, uh, to our uh, countries, uh, two aspects, a very strong solidarity in actions. Uh, we have seen in our countries uh, cooperatives supporting the healthcare institutions, civil productions, local communities, uh, a strong solidarity and intercooperation among sectors and enterprises, and of course, a strong commitment of, of cooperatives in our countries to support local communities, people, uh, workers, employees, staff. So uh, we, we um, uh, invented the slogan, uh, la cooperazione non si ferma, which means cooperatives uh, do not stop just to underline how much we are uh, working and supporting uh, citizens and people during this difficult, difficult uh, situation. Please, Mina, go on. Uh, as mentioned, um, Cooperatives Europe, as you know, is uh, the multi-sectoral representative association uh, of uh, European cooperatives gathering uh, uh, 86 member organization from 34 countries. And let me say that uh, under the species of cooperative with Europe and its board that uh, is uh, perfectly gender balanced. In February 2008, we launched a working group devoted to gender equality. And the coordination of this group was entrusted to the Alliance of Italian Cooperatives. At present, we have 12 European countries, two sectoral European organizations. Of course, our doors is always open and we are confident uh, to have all the European uh, cooperative organization and all the sectoral ones in our, in our membership. The main goals is working together to promote the exchange and sharing of best practice on gender equality, to work for the empowerment of women on corporate welfare, women entrepreneurship, of course, on the governance level uh, to promote more and more um, women in the decision-making positions. And uh, we have identified also as a common challenge to face the fight against any form of violence and harassment. And of course, we work on this with the European institutions that are very important for us. And thanks to Cooperatives Europe, just on the 26th of March, we have the meeting with the cabinet of the European Commissioner, Elena Dalli, in charge of equality. And it was very positive and interesting exchange of what together we can do to promote gender equality, participating, of course, also in the consultation of important and strategic uh, document of the Commission that was recently issued. Uh, we are also drafting on a charter of commitment for the European Cooperative Organization on Gender Equality on the basis of important documents that have been already issued by some national member organization, and we would like to extend this good and best practice also to the European level. Um, but since we are members of a global movement, the International Cooperative Alliance, we work with our colleagues in Africa, America, Asia, Pacific regions, because uh, we think that united in our diversity, we are all committed to contributed 
including the multifaceted aspects entailing uh, the, the promotion of gender equality. Uh, well before the next 100 years, as you know, there is no country in the world that have uh, attained uh, the gender equality, but we think that the women cooperators and cooperatives in general uh, at regional at global level can be on the front uh, to, to try to make the utmost to close as soon as possible uh, the, the gender equality gap. Please, Mina, go on. Um, let me also, of course, make reference to the International Cooperative Alliance. Uh, 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 beyond the data that you will uh, read on my presentation, I want to underline the, that there was a commitment to women empowerment and gender equality. I say since 120 years, because you know that this year, the International Cooperative Alliance uh, will celebrate the 120 years anniversary. Um, but let me say that without the ICA, without its regions, its sector, uh, the collaboration with the supranational and international organization, it would be really, really not possible to attain the important result, the progress and the advancement that we have made uh, all, over, all over the country during, uh, during this, uh, this year. Uh, and the issues is, uh, is, of course, at the centers of the activity of the Alliance, of its region, as we have heard about uh, the presentation of the colleagues that took uh, the floor before me. But also because it is not only a good, right, and just things to do to promote gender equality, but also because it has a huge impact in terms of competitiveness of countries, of enterprises. Uh, the diversity management is a wealth for our organization. And I, I want also to underline the fact that women use also to choose the cooperative form of enterprises. Uh, let me also share a personal, a personal memories. Uh, I am involved in international affairs since some years, uh, and I have had the opportunity to see concretely in all the areas, in all the regions of the world, how much it was important, the cooperative form of enterprises for women cooperators. This applies to developing countries, emerging countries, emerged countries, developed ones. There is no difference. Despite the difference that we can have, you can find examples throughout the world of how much it was important for the empowerment of women uh, to give them voice, to count in economy, in societies, to become leader in their respective countries, changing also attitude. And let me say that it was not an easy task for many colleagues of us. Please, Mina, go on. Uh, mentioning the ICA, uh, I am the privilege also to share uh, what we do within the Gender Equality Committee of the International Cooperative Alliance. Uh, starting from the adv advocacy and the promotion of gender equality policies and programs within countries and regions, good practice sharing, the prevention of gender violence. Uh, this is uh, an issue on which uh, the four regions of the world uh, that uh, are within the ICA Gender Equality Committees underline how much it is important and also the important role that cooperatives can play as economic and uh, uh, social organization also to change and to fight uh, again the deep root of gender violence. Um, we are working uh, uh, because we, we need to collect the gender statistics and so we are working together to improve also this important aspect that is fundamental as you can easily understand also for developed policies and also uh, to, to, to understand the problem and the issues at stake. Uh, we are working on visibility strategy for the promotion of gender issues in the ICA family. Uh, 
um, working with the regions through uh, its uh, regional gender committees, the sectors, a website devoted, and of course, knowledge sharing. Knowledge sharing it is uh, uh, an important issue uh, on which, uh, on which uh, we, are, we are working. Uh, you can find, of course, also some data about uh, the importance uh, that uh, women make up uh, in Ethiopia, uh, in Nigeria, and uh, in the Philippines, even though you cannot read them perfectly. Thank you, Mina. Uh, coming, uh, coming to my country, to Italy, uh, as mentioned, uh, uh, the Women and Equality Commission of the Alliance of Italian Cooperatives was set up in, 19, in 2016, and it is the result of the aggregation of three gender equality bodies, AGCI, Conf Cooperative, and Lega Coop. Uh, these are three main important uh, national APEX cooperative organizations. You know that in my country, the cooperative movement uh, well rooted and quite consolidated. Uh, we represent more or less 8% of the GDP, providing job opportunities um, to almost uh, 1 million and 300 people. Cooperatives, Italian cooperatives belong to 12,000, uh, 12 million uh, members. So uh, these three organizations that uh, created the Alliance of the Italian Cooperatives has also worked um, on, on the, the gender issues. Uh, uh, as you can imagine, of course, working together as three organizations on the gender issues has increased considerably also our uh, capabilities <clears throat> to give it the proper visibility to what we do and also to work within the organization as well as in with our institutions. Um, please go on, Mina. Uh, our commission has promoted the dissemination of good practice, especially on work-life balance carried out by our cooperatives. Many cooperatives and introduced tools for work flexibility and for the care of elderly and disabled. Uh, we are promoting practices for the sharing of family load between, between the men and increasing paternal leave. Um, of course, we work to increase the women's leadership and our commission has performed activity within the organization to guarantee the quotas on the board of the decision-making bodies of cooperatives and the apex level. Please, Mina, I'm just approaching to my conclusion. Uh, in our cooperatives, women make up 24% uh, of the board members and 23.9% of the management and many present of important cooperatives are women. Uh, we work to support the women entrepreneurship. Uh, we have, of course, important uh, component uh, in our membership represented by women cooperatives. But for women cooperatives, we represent, we mean cooperatives with a large membership of women, not only uh, women cooperatives. Um, and of course, in other film, it is the top of the project to include in the market inclusion of sexually abused victims. Uh, please, Mina. Uh, some lesson learned. <clears throat> I think that it's fundamental uh, to support the women cooperators and cooperatives who are changing actors in local communities and countries with a peer-to-peer -peer approach to implement the SDGs, a prerequisite to attend the other 17 SDGs. <clears throat> let, me, let me say that uh, cooperatives can really be, and they are acknowledged by also the international institutions as a pillar to make a reality at global, regional, and national levels, uh, the implementation of the 17 SDGs. And it is important to strengthen the gender mainstreaming with a multi-sectoral and intergenerational approach involving our young colleagues, women, and men. I am sure, I'm confident that probably during the last, the next 10 years, our younger colleagues will be able to make uh, an, an important leap forward. And probably for, since uh, we took 40 years, more or less, to reach at the present uh, level of gender equality, I am sure and confident 
that uh, they will be the generation that will close the gender, the gender gap. Uh, it is important, as mentioned by the colleague, to work on legislation, barriers, stereotype, ownership, violence, always with a multi-stakeholder approach. It is important to create an ecosystem promoting a culture of gender equality at 360 degrees. A fundamental role played in the different world region by the Women Empowerment and Equality Commissions uh, networks within local national organizations. So strong advocacy and visibility action has been carried out. It is fundamental to have a national level such kind of committee, a commission working with several institutions, with several stakeholders, because uh, this is a battle that unites a lot of people that share our vision and principle and values. Please. Thanks, Stefania, for finishing, please. Yes, I'm just finishing. Okay. And another important issue is uh, uh, the governance, access to credit and financial tool, the gender budgeting, support to women and cooperative entrepreneurship and leadership, with a specific attention to the new technologies, included, included uh, artificial intelligence, because we know that algorithms are not uh, neutral. And so it is important also to work on that, uh, on that uh, aspect. Pivotal role assured by the ELOCOP branch and the UN agency as a wall in cooperation with the International Cooperative Alliance and member organization, local institutions, civil society organization and trade unions. And I want also, since we are celebrating this year the 100th anniversary of the International Labor Organization, I think that uh, on behalf of the women cooperators uh, of the world, we uh, should say a big thanks to the work and the effort that you are doing. Let's strengthen our collaboration, since together we can make the difference, also in the light of the pandemic impact on gender equality. There could be no recovery, no renaissance, no sustainable development, nor sustainable future world if we do not close as much as possible the gender equality gap still persisting all over the domains and countries. And just, uh, Mina, please, the last, uh, I finish, but I want to finish my presentation also making reference to the words of two colleagues, two leaders uh, from uh, American regions. Uh, and uh, and you, you will see, uh, we talk about uh, the president of the ICA Americas and board member of the ICA, Gabriela, and Maria Eugenia, president of the Gender Equality Committee. From the words of these two colleagues and two leaders, you can really, really understand how much is it important to work together. And since we are so committed uh, to close as much as possible the gender equality gap. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefania. <coughs> uh, so we jump to Nadia now. The last speaker, Nadia, please. You are with us. Yes. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello, Nadia. Yeah. Hello. Hello, yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, I'm good to go. Okay. Great. Um, so thank you for inviting me to speak on today's panel. Um, I'm, uh, I, I jumped into this a little, a little late this morning, so my apologies. Uh, I'll get some more light on here. So I was invited today to uh, talk about, uh, specifically about a, a, some research that I did, uh, it completed with a colleague of mine, uh, cooperative specialist Fiona Dugut. And, um, I'm going to talk today about this COPAC report. Uh, the COPAC is the Committee for the Promotion and Advancement of Cooperatives. Um, uh, we looked at uh, gender equality and women's empowerment in cooperatives around the world. And uh, this study was done in 2015 and published in 2016. Um, and then I, I'm just going to provide a little bit of uh, 
commentary information about another piece of research that we did for the International Development Research Center in Canada, IDRC, uh, looking at the intersection of women's economic empowerment, informal working sectors and collectivization, because I think it has some real resonance with what's going on in cooperative sector. Um, and then I have a few comments on COVID-19, but not a lot right now. Um, so next slide. Thank you. Uh, so the research we conducted for COPAC on gender equality and women's empowerment and cooperatives uh, was a literature which review which followed a, a survey. And out of the survey, um, the respondents indicated that cooperatives uh, have had a, an increasingly positive impact on women's economic and social empowerment, enabling women's inclusion in the labor force and formal economy and that cooperatives can enhance further their ability to empower women by collaborating with civil society um, and gaining a voice in the policy making processes and that cooperatives need to and can continue to develop policies that support women from within. And so we built on this uh, survey findings and went on to collect research from around the world about what was going on in cooperatives uh, in terms of supporting women. Um, so, so this is an attempt to create a snapshot of what was happening globally in cooperatives in terms of um, playing an increasing uh, role in uh, women's empowerment. Um, so I'm going to touch briefly on uh, some results from, uh, we did a small sectoral analysis. It wasn't a huge part of the study, but it gives you a sort of an overview of the um, some of the challenges that came out of the study, and then I'll talk about the recommendations. So the short sectoral analysis looked at the opportunities and challenges for women in the agriculture, uh, finance, and the broader uh, category of consumer cooperatives. And um, we found that within all three of these sectors, there were overarching and interrelated factors that inhibited, in, inhibited women, specifically, uh, the lack of access to means of production, land and labor, um, which was stemming from an overall uh, disadvantage in the labor market due to systemic discrimination. Um, and this has resulted in women being overrepresented in the informal, low paying and unpaid sectors of the economy, domestic work, handicraft production, child and home care, and unpaid agricultural work. Uh, so leadership opportunities for women, even in the more resourced and progressive sector of financial cooperatives was still under gender, gender parity globally. Um, and women in higher ranking leadership positions was found mainly in consumer co-ops as they tended to be uh, all women co-ops uh, in a sector dominated by undervalued industry, childcare, domestic work and, and handicraft production. So um, the recommendations that came out of the study fell into four areas. Uh, we looked at policy, things that could be done in policy legislation, um, the operations within cooperative, uh, women's capacity building and research needs. Um, and within the area of policy and legislation, it was found that cooperatives um, are supporting gender and equality, women's gender equality and women's empowerment. However, there was uh, a need to expand this support. Um, and this support could extend to addressing external challenges, including state policies and laws and social and uh, cultural norms that have created the barriers uh, to women's full engagement in cooperatives or gender equality being actualized. So our, the recommendations that came out of it uh, around policy and legislation were to, of course, more generally to work to overcome cultural and structural barriers for women. Uh, to create enabling environments uh, that allow women farmers to create their own cooperatives, uh, to advocate on behalf of women in countries in which land laws and the practice of distributing agricultural related resources are discriminatory against women. Um, and uh, the recommendations for improving uh, gender equality, increasing women's empowerment within the operations, um, meaning the internal cooperative operations management, strategic planning, were to uh, work to address gender, uh, I'll just say we, uh, uh, women's economic empowerment, just to shorten this up, uh, by setting uh, gender equality strategies um, and plans of action 
and along with implementing tracking and measurement mechanisms to capture the progress on the commitments to these actions and have these within every cooperative um, and to provide women in emerging and marginalized cooperatives with financial and technical support to model gender parity and uh, require members to meet and exceed the cooperative and industry standards through policy and awareness raising uh, to assist women in undervalued areas of the consumer cooperative sector to gain more control over production and increased access to economic benefits by supporting women's cooperative integration integration across supply chains uh, to support the development of uh, uh, women's cooperatives more generally, including startup funding, training on cooperative business government, governance, management and operations, and um, creating a more awareness building for potential supportive infrastructure, including financial sector, public officials, lawyers, accountants, funders, women's organizations, any of the enabling organizations that can create an environment around cooperatives. Um, the recommendations related around building women's capacity within the cooperative sector were to um, develop, these, uh, develop and implement these gender equality strategies, tools and resources more broadly to facilitate the equal participation of women throughout the movement um, to continue to support uh, women's cooperatives, including leadership training and government, governance management and operations uh, to support policies and programs and active interventions that will support women to be in leadership positions within cooperatives and to help those, uh, the co their collective voices be, to be heard without the, with it, uh, throughout the sector. And then to be able to track and evaluate the distribution and uh, implementation of training manuals and guides, um, as it was found that solid resources have been produced. There's been quite a lot of them and many good ones, but um, implementation follow through hasn't been a priority. It can, tends to get lost once it's uh, been, they've been uh, distributed out to the cooperatives. Uh, so, and then to enhance the quantity and quality of the resources that are available for training within cooperatives, um, that uh, there's more effort made taking non-cooperative materials uh, from different uh, sectors that can be adapted, adapted to make them cooperative specific um, for the purposes of establishing, growing new cooperatives and uh, um, and for example, taking materials on gender and social enterprise um, and other uh, information sources and training manuals that can be adapted to our sector. Um, it was also found that cooperative members needed to be encouraged to post the results and feedback of their trainings, both on their own websites and possibly to a centralized repository, um, which could include practical publications, support for developing and designing their own individualized learning strategies. Um, and this would give more capacity for the learning to be shared and tracked um, and would support accessibility for all cooperatives everywhere. Um, and, and that we generally need further uh, primary data collection and research uh, to build on shared data, um, enabling the ongoing assessment of gender equality and uh, women's economic empowerment. Um, and finally, in terms of research needs, because uh, of course we were doing uh, a very large research piece, we were quite focused on um, how to access this information and what's available out there. And um, uh, there's some broad pieces that, that we found needed to be addressed. That uh, one being that we need to develop a set of indices of standardized tools, um, indicators or social and economic yardsticks based on challenges faced specifically by women in cooperative sector, so that we're able to really uh, uh, measure the impact in terms of gender, uh, of how we're doing with gender equality, apologies for that noise, uh, gender equality um, or women's empowerment. And that uh, we need a study to be conducted specifically looking at emerging women's cooperative sector around the world in order to obtain the overall numbers of women participating information about uh, that will profile women's cooperatives women members employees salaries patronage um, in addition to collection of the standardized indicators uh, 
from women's cooperatives on uh, women's empowerment and impact. And this would assist greatly in uh, developing this broader picture of how cooperatives are supporting women. Um, and this also would include uh, collecting annual standardized disaggregated data about women and cooperatives around the globe. We, we've found that there, there's a lot of data out there, but sometimes it focuses more generally on men and women. Um, and uh, so there needs to be more specific data about, about women. Um, and there also uh, needs to be more that compares cooperatives uh, against cooperatives or with cooperatives and also to other organizational structures, um, other collectives, other private industries um, to, see, to see how to develop and how to look at those standardized indicators for gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, so looking across these key findings, um, it can be surmised that given the right environment and support, cooperatives uh, can and do play a major role in promoting and achieving gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, examples of cooperatives with good gender equality policies do exist, uh, but the literature, at least at this time, that was now uh, five years ago, uh, shows that women are still feeling the impact of gender equality in terms of participation, leadership, and access. Um, and uh, women's cooperatives face, it, women's cooperatives, I meaning cooperatives that are exclusively women uh, or mainly women, face a similar situation in that many of, of them are supportive of women's empowerment, but uh, the external forces and the societal challenge, challenges of gender norms in particular contexts around the world can erode or undermine progressive gender practices, even within an exclusively women's cooper women based cooperative. So if you're interested in reading this report, uh, I think the link can be sent out or if it hasn't already, and you can have a, have a look at that. Um, next slide. So I wanted to just make a few comments about the, a study, another study that I worked on uh, with Fiona Dugut again, um, that looked at how uh, women in formal workers participation in various types of collectives intersects with increases of empowerment. Um, and within this study, cooperatives, of course, fell under the category of enabling organizations that support the collectivization of women and formal workers, and in turn, opportunities for leadership and economic power more generally. Um, and we looked at the how these how women were supported through different levels and we looked at them through these dimensions micro meso and macro with mac, micro being the individual and personal level meso the relational or belonging to a network or collective and macro this was the level that actual leadership and um, working on the broader uh, societal and institutional context uh, that's where it lay and we looked at the elements of resources, agency, and achievements that were within the, each of these. Um, and uh, because I don't have a lot of time left, I won't get into that. But um, the research showed that, of course, working through uh, for women to actually achieve this level of, of leadership, um, these all of uh, the, the micro level needs really need to be prioritized. So the practical needs, the daycare, uh, the access to um, a safe environment, uh, protection against violence, um, health need to be issues that are prioritized before um, issues particular to employment can be addressed um, as many women are subsisting. So these uh, collectives have to uh, exist first and foremost to um, address practical needs of women. And um, in terms of, I mean, as cooperatives are, there's this, uh, the, the uh, idea of working together um, needs to focus on local and soft solutions. So um, employment, individual employment uh, members have to understand why they are there and um, that they can access immediate benefits from being uh, a part of the collective. So addressing multiple barriers to women joining often has to be dealt with before women feel that they want to join or, or there's any benefit to join. Um, and moving along, it, 
there has to be this uh, build this idea of uh, worker worker identity, um, you know, coming out of that that, uh, that 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 they belong to a collective we, and that there's a um, there's a benefit to uh, working along and through differences um, and having a shared identity. Anyway, I'm skipping through this and networks, decision making, financial support, of course, is is very important. Um, I'm going to uh, move it along and just say that um, the, um, you know, empowerment for women is ongoing, it's relative, uh, it's contested, and it's uh, shared within and across collectives and individual women informal workers. Um, and it's also clearly demonstrated that, um, that women informal workers benefit from collective action and um, in this case, we're talking about cooperatives, um, that uh, the, the enabling organizations provide the environment that women need to have the strength to, uh, to, to work in a safe environment. Um, but there's a no one size fits all for, for developing these structures. Um, I just wanted to make one bridging comment into the COVID-19 and then I'm going to wrap it up. Um, but that um, in relation to COVID-19, there was a really interesting uh, element that came up in terms of identifying what, what has made uh, collect, a women's collective successful. And often one of the biggest uh, items uh, or ideas or elements is coincidence. So something like a natural disaster or a strange, uh, you know, uh, a surprise thing that happens um, can provide the catalyst for uh, women being recognized as valuable. And so in this case, we can see with the COVID pandemic that, uh, that uh, care cooperatives and women working in these, uh, in these, uh, in this, and up to this point, undervalued sectors are are now being seen as the front line, the people that are saving others in society. Um, and potentially we could see this as a as a shifting catalyst moment for increasing uh, the way people value women's uh, informal or undervalued work in the uh, in society. So I'm wrapping it up. Thank you, thank you Nadia. <laughs> so uh, thank you uh, for uh, all the speakers. So I would not make a summary of the discussion because we are quite late. Uh, so just to raise some questions that we have not the capacity to, to put all the questions that have been uh, sent because we have many. Just uh, to make a kind of summary in we have still seven, eight minutes, so I will ask the speaker to respond very, very quickly. Uh, one question to Mirai and Stefania is how much lockdown measure have affected the cooperative and what kind of initiative to support the cooperative have been taken? Mirai? <coughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm a bit slow. Yeah. So um, if I understood what kind, I couldn't hear very well, Philippe, but what kind of measures have been taken by cooperatives and how can cooperatives be helped? I think one of the things that um, we learned was that having a base, a cooperative base at the grassroots level during a pandemic or crisis like this, quickly we can take action. And one of this was that all our artisan cooperatives who normally make very beautiful embroidered products, they all know how to sew. So they began to sew masks, as I mentioned, in large quantities. And similarly, our health cooperative was able to keep the pharmacies open 24 by 7, produce the sanitizers and so on and so forth. So cooperatives were, some of the cooperatives were able to, and our women farmer cooperatives, vegetable cooperatives were able to keep supplying vegetables. So some of the cooperatives were indeed able to help. Others of the cooperatives, frankly, I'm sorry to say, are in deep trouble. Uh, for example, catering cooperative, um, then cleaning cooperative, domestic workers cooperative, income is completely, revenues income is completely dried up. 
And in fact, I would say, yeah, would say that, you know, now it's a question of their survival. Yeah. No measure has been taken by government, particularly to help co cooperatives. Um, not at the moment. The government is considering measures for small, micro and medium enterprises. And of course, cooperatives would come into that. There's a lot of discussion, but we're waiting still to hear. Organizations like ours have sent appeals to government that at least wage roll compensation fixed costs should be covered for at least six months. Otherwise, these cooperatives, particularly the small women cooperatives, sadly will go under. Yeah. We'll have to close down. Thank you, Mirai. Stefania, in, in one minute, the same question. Impact of the lockdown measure on cooperative and the kind of support received from the government, if any. Okay. So, can you hear me? Yeah. No. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, f first of all, uh, Philippe, uh, there is a very, very harsh situation in my country. Uh, the first estimate uh, are that 217,000 workers are at risk uh, with the social cooperative, service, gathering, cleaning, tourism, culture, logistic and transport, very, very hit by the COVID pandemic. Um, of course, uh, there are two kinds of measures. The first one is the, your, the National Apex Cooperative Organization, the Alliance of the Italian Cooperatives, has uh, put available all their internal tools to support uh, local cooperatives in this difficult, uh, difficult situation, uh, included, of course, also to help them to reposition, to recovery, uh, uh, and so on, uh, by means also of uh, financial tools that cooperatives has worked out and implemented during the years. Then, of course, we work with our institutions, with government, um, and uh, I think that more or less every three, four days when there is a new decree law uh, issuing, um, uh, we take part, uh, of course, uh, uh, and put forward the reason and the needs and the request of the cooperative movement to our institution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe now a question to Sifa. Uh, how do you see, and this is a general question, it means uh, how equitable, uh, and in this case, uh, between men and women, uh, do you feel the cooperative sector is inside cooperative? Sorry, I did not get it. Please, can you come back again? Sorry. Yeah, yeah the question is uh, that can be raised is how equitable, equitable is the cooperative sector in your view? Inside the sector, I mean, gender equality inside the sector. Yeah, thank you very much, Philip. I did allude to that, uh, though very um, uh, briefly. Um, the cooperative movement does not live in a vacuum. It's a reflection of the society. Yeah. So definitely, since the society is still uh, inequitable, so basically there are those things which filters. As much as the cooperative movement uh, is um, able and, uh, and uh, capable of addressing the issue of uh, gender equity and equality, but uh, fortunately, uh, unfortunately, um, since the same same people come from the larger community, which is still inequitable. So there are some of those uh, residues or some of those biases which also filters. So uh, I will safely say that uh, we are not yet there fully, though uh, we, are doing, we, we are faring better, um, but uh, we are not yet uh, there fully because of the inheritance nature of, uh, uh, of the whole topic vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the environment in which the cooperative uh, Movement operate in. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Adia, maybe a question that, uh, as you, you, you made a lot of study, uh, what is there is that women cooperative economic activity <coughs> that are lucrative, that works well, can be taken by male actors? And what kind of strategy can take women to help that men at the end recuperate? The activities. Nadia. Sorry, could you could you stay, ask that question again? 
uh, was yeah. about. Yeah, it means <clears throat> what evidence is there is that women cooperative economic activities when they are becoming <clears throat> very um, uh, generating income, good income, productive activity, male take over. Well, yes, yeah, <laughs> there, there is evidence of that. And um, I mean, there's, uh, you know, these very uh, interesting setups of, I mean, of, of wonderful collectives and co-ops that happen where there's women all the way through and then there's a man at the top who's, who's leading, leading the cooperative, but it's the women doing all the work. And um, I, I think, you know, as uh, uh, Sifa said before, the societal structures, until they change, until there's more addressing of the external uh, societal norms where uh, women aren't going into households or into community structures where their resources are being uh, resources and their their leadership is being undermined by um, paternalistic or uh, policies and practices, then you're going to see you're going to continue to see that that happening. So women have always had to be more clever about <laughs> setting up strategies that help keep their resources and their, their production um, to support them and their families. Um, sorry, that's not a great answer, but oh. it, it, it sort of, how, it, it depends on the context of what's yeah, happening. I imagine, yeah. So it's still happening. Here, because we say we, we were supposed to, to, to stop at free, well, we have no much, a lot of time to speak about uh, and to ask the question we received. So I thank you uh, uh, all very much, particularly uh, our speakers uh, that made great presentation with uh, providing a, a variety of view uh, of the situation of gender equality in the cooperative movement. Uh, so thank you very much. And thank you very much, Simel, for organizing this event. And a good luck for the next one. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. All Thank good you. wishes, everybody. Stay safe. Yeah, you Bye. too. Thanks Bye. Very Keep much. in touch. Bye. All the best Bye. to all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.